Hi, and welcome to episode number 98 of the weekly Google Club Platform Podcast. I am Francis Campoy, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mandel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I am good. How are you doing today? I am pretty tired because, you know, uh, we had to wake up really early. You had to do something at 8 a.m. It wasn't that bad. That is incredibly early for me. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. I come from a different time zone. I was born in Barcelona, different time zone, so I'm still jet lag. Jet lag. Yeah. Just still, still jet lag from there. But anyway, very excited. And I think I, I am pretty excited, but you're probably more excited than me about this episode because it's about Australia. That was well done. Thank you. Yeah. I've been practicing. Yeah, we have Andrew Walker and Graham Polly. Uh, we're talking about basically how a new region for a Google Cloud platform opened up in Sydney and the impact it's had on the businesses and technology people down there. Yep, and also uh, the things they're missing and asking for. And be query. PMs listen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then at the end, we will have a question that comes from one of our listeners. It's a really cool question because it's about TensorFlow and whether it's useful or not for linear algebra. Like like we use TensorFlow for machine mm-hmm. learning and AI. Is it also useful for other things? So we'll answer that question. Yep. But before that, we have our three cool things of the week. And the first one comes from France. Uh, there's uh, Raphael Simon, which is uh, the CTO of a uh, CTO and co-founder of a bank named Shine, and they explain how they did uh, how they implemented the whole thing, which is really cool because uh, they have like very like, high availability. They have five nines. And they explain how all of their technical choices, going from Firebase to running other microservices using Apache and Flex with the cool cloud endpoints. And then on top of that, they talk about the database. And the database is really cool because they go with Spanner. And they explain all of the things to the point that they even give you pro tips, uh, saying, like, you know, it's like this is the way we implemented these, are the things we learned, and stuff like that. Super cool, definitely worth reading. And if Rafael Simon, you're listening, uh, you're more than invited to yes. join the podcast. Absolutely. I actually also like there was a, a, a little bit in here talking about basically how they used uh, IAM policies as well. Yeah. Being a financial institution, don't want to give access to just anybody to anything. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So really <laughs> good to see that they're taking advantage of that too. Yeah. Very cool. Cool. Um, so next up, we have bigger machines. We, we have bigger machines. So compute engine machine types now go up to 96 virtual CPUs and 624 gigabytes of memory. Oh, it is a lot. That's, that's a lot. Uh, and don't forget that you can always use custom machine types. So if our standard templates don't necessarily work for you, you can sit down and choose exactly what sort of CPUs and memory you need for those machines. And now you can just have more CPU and more memory. I wonder, so if you can go up to 96 CPUs and then you can add, I don't know how many GPUs, and then all of this memory, what would you do with the machine so big? <laughs> like, I really don't know what things. Know, like, play a game? Yeah. Probably, yeah. 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 <laughs> Probably play a game. <laughs> cool. Uh, and then our last cool thing of the week comes from the community. Yep. Uh, Demi Benary, uh, he wrote a Medium blog post on what is cloud data prep and how to use it to prepare your data before doing any kind of big data processing. It is very cool and it is covering a product that we have not really talked about, cloud data prep. And you know what? We actually have planned this already and we will have an episode coming up soon with the product manager from cloud data prep. Yep, and thanks to Demi, especially because he's a GDE as well. Yeah, Google developer experts, you all rule. Yes. Awesome. Well, Francesc, I think it's time to go talk to Andrew and Graham all about this new Sydney region. A conversation with three Australians? Okay. Absolutely fantastic. Let's go with that. <laughs> So I'm very excited to yet again surround Francesc by a bunch of Australians. We have podcast alumni, Graham Polly, and one of his compatriots, Andrew Walker, joining us today to talk all about the region that has recently opened up in Sydney, Australia, and how that's changed things down there. Uh, Before we get stuck into that, though, how are you both doing? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm doing great. It's Graham here. It's, uh, It's great to be back on the podcast since last time. Yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, what about you, Andrew? It's great to be on my first podcast, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Excellent. Uh, before we get stuck into the topic at hand, why don't we get some background on both of you? Graham, you've been on the podcast before, so Andrew, please go first. Uh, tell us a little about who you are, what do you do, what company you work for. I'm the founder of Three Weeks. Uh, we specialize in building stuff for mostly enterprise customers using serverless technologies. Uh, so that's usually a combination of like web, mobile, gadgets, uh, big data, quite often machine learning. 
Uh, we've done 190 projects on GCP now, uh, which is usually with uh, App Engine at the middle. Uh, but we often use those other things like uh, you know, the, the uh, machine learning API and, and BigQuery. Um, despite the name, usually we work on big transformation projects that have failed a couple of times before. Um, the name, in case someone asks, is just about breaking into small chunks. Cool. Uh, what about you, Graham? Remind our audience who are you and what you do. Happy to. Um, so I'm Graham Polly. I'm a software engineer based out of Melbourne, Australia. And I work for Shine Solutions. Uh, Shine Solutions are a enterprise digital consultancy. We've got offices in Melbourne and, and Sydney now. And I'm also an official Google developer expert for Google Cloud. Um, still the only one in Australia for cloud. So um, that's quite an honor to hold. And yeah, I work a lot with uh, data and analytics um, on the Google stack. So primarily around BigQuery, Dataflow, Dataproc, and the ML APIs. Cool. All right. So we thought you'd get the two of you together. This is something we haven't really done before. Uh, recently, there was a new Google Cloud Platform region that has started, uh, that has been brought up in Sydney, Australia. I sort of wanted to talk about the sort of impact that that has had for both of you and the areas in which you work in Australia. I thought I'd start uh, maybe by taking a step back a little and one of you can choose. I, I don't know which one, but sort of I want to explain the current internet situation in Australia. Uh, it's a little less than ideal uh, for a variety of reasons. Who, who wants to take this one? Like, I just want to sort of get some background there. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd love to do that. So I guess the, the biggest thing about Australia is our remoteness. A lot of, you know, people who are really closely connected, like in Europe and America, are, I guess, used to having high speeds of connectivity between point A and point B. Uh, so, you know, for the last 10 years, uh, we've been dealing with round trip uh, times to either the west coast of America or somewhere up in Asia or somewhere in Europe. Uh, so we've had to work around that. And I guess... The second thing is that our uh, our infrastructure here in Australia is is not great. Um, uh, you know, in, in the lead up to the conversation, Graham was saying that he's actually connecting over four G uh, mm. just to make this podcast, and I'm doing exactly the same thing because my internet connection at home is just so poor. Uh, so you know, that's meant that we've had to work around things a lot for the last few years uh, while we build solutions for enterprise. Interesting. Uh, so you were mentioning that this is uh, like. In your houses, the connectivity is not that good. But what about uh, the office? Like, as a developer, is this something that changes the way you you write code, specifically cloud solutions and stuff? So we do everything in the cloud. We're we're an assetless company. We're a we're a serverless company. So connectivity is is huge for us. Um, normally at offices, it's fine. Uh, I say normally, like we'll get outages during the middle of the day sometimes at our office, and then we all switch to back up on four G. So, as a company, our, our biggest expense outside airfares and, and entertainment is actually uh, internet connectivity. So, I guess then, um, like especially with you, Graham, you work in big data sets. You're not pulling down terabytes of data backwards and forwards? Well, no. A, a common pattern that I, I normally employ is actually bring the code to the data, not the data to the code, right? Mm. So, using tools like and services like BigQuery, where that data is, is, is stored, uh, currently in the US, writing the SQL and UDF functions for that is, is a much better pattern rather than downloading massive data sets and working locally or spinning up other VMs and working there. One of the big changes for me with the new Sydney region is, although BigQuery is not there yet, we have Dataflow in region. So customers are a lot happier now. They're, they're closer to the data. They feel more secure. So that data can be processed and stored uh, locally in Australia. And that's fantastic. So, so we're spinning up Dataflow pipelines in region now. And uh, that, that's a game changer for us because it makes those conversations a lot easier to have with enterprises especially their security operations and privacy, because they, they feel more comfortable that, they, that the data is now uh, stored locally. So I'm curious about what you were mentioning about the locality of data. Is there specific Australian policies that make it that you need to have the data stored in the country? Or is it more about people really just feeling more comfortable about it? There's, there's actually laws and, and it, 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 it's around data sovereignty. So if any of the data has... PII information, so personally mm -hmm. identifiable information, that can't be shipped offshore. That has okay. to stay in Australia. And that's a challenge for us, and that's always been a challenge for us in the past. So that's what I mean with the new data center or the new region coming online in Sydney. It makes those conversations a lot easier. We've worked around that in the past by applying hashing to the data. 
So that means we don't have any plain text PII in our analytics inside our data. So, th so, so that's gotten us around those challenges with security and privacy in the past. So having it, having the new region now in Sydney, and especially with, with Dataflow, it just means that those conversations are a lot easier to have because the data is stored locally. Andrew, have you had uh, similar such situations where before the region spun up, there were certain workarounds you had to put in place? Yeah, look, our, uh, our experience has been slightly different. We do less work in government and uh, finance, mainly because they have some very specific legislation, specifically in PII, that, uh, that, that holds them back. We've had less constraint because we avoid those uh, in the main, though we have done things like ministerial briefing systems you know, in Google Cloud before. So they're really the, the core issue for us uh, has typically been away from sovereignty and more towards privacy. And with privacy in most sectors, it hasn't been such a, a large theoretical issue. Uh, but actually, the theoretical issue is, is sort of irrelevant. Having data in Australia just means you don't have six months of lead time to win a job. That's as simple as it gets for us. You know, having the, the, the region here just means there's 10 conversations with 10 separate groups of people that we just don't have to have because mm -hmm. They're not confused. Uh, so I can give you probably three examples of projects that we're doing recently here in Australia. Uh, one for a big utility company for field force, uh, you know, field engineers. Uh, another one in, in retail. Another one in, actually, ironically, in the finance sector. Uh, all of which have kicked off a lot more quickly because we haven't had to have those discussions around privacy in particular. And we've had to employ the same sorts of issues even in web solutions that Graham was talking about. So we've had to make sure that we spend a little bit more time on premise uh, preparing data before it goes out, create some web services for things that we don't want to store in the cloud and so on. And all of those just disappear for everything except big data. That, that whole problem has just gone away for us on App Engine. Nice. So I'm wondering now, uh, you mentioned that one of the things that have been solved is the locality and the fact that the data doesn't leave the country, which solves a series of, of problems. Is there any other things that the fact that Google opened a new cloud uh, computing region in, in Australia has fixed for you? Yeah, a good example of this is a big project we did for one of the media players here where we opened up all of the content uh, for basically all of their digital and actually newspaper estates uh, right across like 150 estates. Back in those days, latency was a really big issue for us. We've been able to avoid latency as an issue when it comes down to sort of user-facing apps on App Engine because the latency of sort of like a quarter of a second or a fifth of a second, you know, wasn't something that really had to be taken into account for user experience. But when you're building an API, you need like 30 milliseconds, 50 millisecond response times. So we've had to use Amazon in situations like that in the past. We do that project again today, and I get to do that on GCP now. Yeah, I think the latency, the round trip latency is, is an important one as well. Right? So on average in the past, I'd be getting maybe 250, 300 milliseconds. And now I'm seeing 10 to 15 milliseconds, which is fantastic. So wow. yeah, you can go to, do you guys know the GCP ping website? It's really cool. Yes. Go to, yeah, go to GCP ping. And now for the Sydney region, I'm seeing, yeah, even, even sometimes below 10 milliseconds. It's fantastic. Nice. That is awesome. So, Andrew, you mentioned that uh, you were using Amazon for some of the things, and that is true. Uh, before Google Cloud had a region, Amazon was already there. So why using Google Cloud? Is there any benefit or advantage that you that makes you use it? Yeah, absolutely. Look, we've, we're fast becoming 100% GCP, especially with the region opening up in Australia. And that's not because, uh, you know, like we're actually not resellers. Uh, we, we make our money out of building stuff for people. So it really comes down to money. You know, we, we had a client on stage at the Google Cloud Summit explaining just how much cheaper it is to build on GCP, and it really just comes down to serverless. You know, GCP is genuinely serverless, whereas Amazon never really has been, not in a practical sense. They have, uh, you know, they have their equivalent to Cloud Functions in Lambda, but they don't have an equivalent to App Engine. With the richness of services that, that gives, it's it's just such an exciting technology, and I do also agree <laughs> with Graham that you know BigQuery and, and supporting services is just it's got to be the crown jewel. We get fifty percent of our speed benefits. Like we, we generally move at fifty percent faster than anyone else. We usually uh, deliver somewhere between a quarter to a half of the budget uh, of our of our competitors. 
and 50% of that speed advantage comes just from serverless cloud and that's really what GCP is for us. We, we have the whole deploy on Monday thing, uh, so you know we're not, we're not spending four weeks as we have done on some of our Amazon projects just waiting and having discussions around infrastructure. Okay, it might be in the cloud, but you're still engineering it, uh, which is really painful when you have to go back to that from a serverless world. Uh, the scale to zero thing is quoted by our customers as, you know, we've got, uh, you know, 200 environments. The fact that so many of those scale to zero makes a massive operational cost impact. Uh, we're, like we're talking in some cases, 10% of the cost of the Amazon infrastructure. So, you know, these things uh, make a massive difference. And I guess the one final thing that gives us a huge speed difference in just development uh, is the local emulation of, uh, of on the SDK. So the ability for a developer to run locally without having to be their own DevOps person, uh, you know, without having to set up Tomcat, without having to set up MySQL on the local machine, is really hard to overestimate. It's, it's such a phenomenal thing. Uh, and one of, one of the key things that brings us back to App Engine every time. Out of curiosity, because I'm actually surprised Frances hasn't asked, uh, <laughs> Andrew, what language are you writing on App Engine? <laughs> So we write in Java. Uh, we're not particularly wedded to Java, but we choose one language across the company to give us that, that scale. We like type safety, so we've chosen Java, and, and that killer feature of, of, you know, I think it's only about three languages to support it, of having the local emulation, you know, 100% local emulation, even of task queues, you know, of all the key elements of the things that we're using on an everyday basis. So, you know, one day we'll probably move to Node as a back end when, when we get type safety and that, and that works well for us. Uh, but for the moment, most of the projects we do are in Java. I think another thing worth pointing out is per second billing now. That's huge, right? So that was announced last week. So we now have per second billing on Google Cloud Platform. Yep. And that, that, that's going to save our customers a lot of money, especially for me, writing data flow jobs and batch pipelines. Uh, that, that saves um, our customers and clients a, a lot of money. It's fantastic. Cool. So, Graham, something that you mentioned a couple or even a bunch of times was the fact that there's no BigQuery. So let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love talking about BigQuery. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Uh, so tell us a little bit, not only like why you want BigQuery, I assume that, yeah, BigQuery is, is important, but since BigQuery is not there, but you are a Google developer expert, partly because all of the job that you do BigQuery, what is your experience using BigQuery from a region that doesn't have it yet? Okay, so using BigQuery is a no-brainer. It's it's just a phenomenal product, and and Andrew touched on it already. F for me, and I think Andrew will, will agree, it's the, it's the jewel in the crown for Google Cloud Platform. There's no product like it. it. It's the speed at which you can grind through data. It's the scale. It's the ease of use. It's got a good REST API. It's now got standard SQL. It's, it's just a fantastic product. We've been using BigQuery since 2012, 2013, so quite a few years. And we've been in at Telstra, which is uh, Australia's largest ISP and telco. And, and we've worked around the issues of not having BigQuery in region. And, and I touched on this earlier by, by hashing a lot of the PII information or, or actually just stripping it out completely. And mm -hmm. that keeps their security and privacy teams happy. There's another little trick that you can do, and maybe not a lot of people know about this, and you, you, you will take a hit on, on performance. But what you can, can actually do is you can still store your data locally, right? So what you could do, because we have the region in Sydney, you could store your data in GCS, so locally in region, and use federated sources in BigQuery because BigQuery does everything in memory, right? So it's gonna pull that data, churn through it in memory in either the EU or the US, but that data is not stored locally, right? So it's only been uh, processed offshore. Now, whether that gets through security constraints and it's, it's something that enterprises are comfortable with, um, I don't know yet. I haven't, haven't, uh, haven't tested it out with large enterprises yet, but it, it's, it's, it's a little trick that maybe people can, can employ to, to get around those issues. But I think the, the, the massive benefit would be getting BigQuery in region, right? So the benefit there would be a lot more enterprise and government and customers would be willing to adopt BigQuery into their workloads if they knew it was in region. And, mm. and, and that again comes down to having PII. It's all about PII. 
Um, and if it was in region, they would be a lot more comfortable with that. So fingers crossed, if, if we can build enough use cases and, and show Google the, the value of having BigQuery in region, then maybe it will come online uh, in the near future. So I'm, I'm holding out for that one. <laughs> Everything I can say is that the product managers for BigQuery, they do listen to the podcast, so... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah. So, guys, I wouldn't mind also adding uh, a little bit to that. Yeah, go for it. I would agree with everything Graham says. I, I love BigQuery for the bigness of BigQuery. Uh, I think one of the other strengths uh, of the platform that gets overlooked a lot, actually, is is that serv we, we have this phrase in three weeks that says, serverless means Monday. Um, you know, the fact that I can get the stuff up and running and literally get like a terabyte of data up, uh, you know, on Monday morning and incorporate this into a solution, you know, in, into some AI, ML, uh, you know, even even just the simplest thing of just treating it as a reporting engine is amazingly cool when you can stand that thing up and it's been stood up, in fact, for you as just part of your project and is immediately available to your project. It's also easy to underestimate that, right? So, you know, normally if I'm having a conversation with someone about how to report on something, again, you know, it's, it's a binary thing. It's it's not, oh, it'll add a couple of days. If there's some non-serverless element, then it's going to add months, right? It adds like two months to talk about it, two months to agree on something. So the fact that we use BigQuery by default uh, as a, a standard reporting engine means that we can provide a whole bunch of functionality around, say, a mobile solution or around a, a web-based solution that you wouldn't be able to do if you're having to stand up a local or even a partially local solution. So I would also say that that is a big factor for bringing BigQuery to Australia. It's at the moment, if I do have to work around things, if I do have to process data in some way, if I have to remove keys uh, internally, I immediately have to involve a whole bunch of people who are resource constrained. And as soon as I do that, I'm in two months. Uh, you know, we had a recent project uh, at a university where we just had to make a small change, uh, exactly like what Graham was describing. But we had to wait for a team of people to do that internally, and it took literally four weeks just to talk to them. So that that whole serverless means Monday thing, I, I couldn't overemphasize. It's so cool being able to stand it up immediately. We write code, we deploy Monday, we deploy Tuesday, customers are using it on Wednesday to do real reporting. And I think the final thing there is Data Studio. You know, as, as Data Studio matures, uh, that is gonna be such a cool tool for us and for our clients. Nice. Um, so I guess looking forward, I'd be kind of curious to hear how that now there is a region in Sydney, how has that changed the plans for what you're planning to develop sort of looking forward? The biggest change for us is that, um, I mean, if I can put it really bluntly, is we're going to let our partnership with Amazon Labs been doing less and less work. And since the Sydney region came on, it's hard to imagine a situation where we would put our hand on our heart and say that we're doing the right thing with our clients' money. Uh, by doubling the budget. I mean, that's literally what we're going to be doing, right? So for us, uh, the most fundamental change is that we're going to sort of become de facto until there's another serverless offering like App Engine and, and the supporting tools. So that's part of it. Uh, but the other part is that we're going to go after some of the clients that we weren't that excited about. And I think government is a good one that Graham mentioned. Uh, we've done some great work in government, but it, they've just been, uh, I guess, scared of the cloud and in some cases not not rightly so but it doesn't matter they're still mm -hmm. scared so so that makes a big difference for us in terms of the sectors that we're going after government comes back onto the radar for us and you put graham yeah um for me at least i'm, I'm for working for sean like uh, i can see the momentum growing now right so it's really gaining traction especially with the new region coming online there's a lot more interest in google cloud platform and the commitment that Google have um, offered for the partner ecosystem, we can see that that's starting to build out. And at GCP, it, it really offers some compelling services to Australian customers that you, you, that you don't get on AWS. Um, we are platform agnostic, so we, we work on, on both platforms, but the differentiator that I see as a Google developer expert is definitely the data and an analytics side of things and the machine learning and AI on, on GCP. So, absolutely, um, it, it opens a lot more doors for us in terms of we can go after big enterprises and government and customers because we don't need to have those hard conversations with security teams about data being shipped offshore. We can now say it can be stored in, 
in region in Sydney. So look, it's it, it it's definitely it's an exciting time. There's a lot of potential for Shine, more customers, and we're really really excited about it. Cool. Well, uh, we're kind of running out of time, but is there anything else other than that the fact that you won BigQuery in Sydney? Uh, <laughs> anything else that you'd like to add? Don't forget Cloud Functions with BigQuery. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and the ML APIs. That would be cool. I think one thing to maybe uh, give a plug for is the Melbourne is having its first ever Google Dev Fest in October. Yeah. So we're really excited about that. Mark, I'm going to see you there, right? You're going to be yeah, presenting. Yeah. yeah, book my flights and everything. Brilliant. I'll be presenting too. I think um, Andrew's sending some of the guys from Three Weeks along. They're going to be showcasing some stuff. And look, that's that's a, that's another indicator of, of how GCP now is, is really getting attention, right? We've never had a dev fest in Melbourne. This is the first one. And it, it's a really exciting time. I guess it's also important to mention that uh, you're also involved with the Google Developers Group Cloud in Melbourne. That's right. So I'm one of the co-organizers of GDG Cloud Melbourne, the meetup. Uh, we spun that up uh, about three months ago, and uh, the growth is is phenomenal. So we already have, I think we're touching on 500 members already after just three months and we've got some great talks great presenters uh, we're getting um, a consistent turnout at the meetup so look it, it, it's really really exciting and getting Googlers to come and speak and talk about Google Cloud Platform it's great for me it's great for the community and I, I'm seeing it firsthand I'm really seeing the community starting to flourish now around GCP and that's a really great thing to see because I've been working on GCP for four or five years now <laughs> and it was a little bit lonely and quiet at the start but but now it's changing and, and and i really think that's down to the new region as well it's fantastic andrew do you have anything else to add yeah i, w I would echo those sentiments you know um actually graham has encouraged us to create uh, the sydney uh, cloud meetup for the google developers group uh, which we're in the process of doing but i would say yeah look five and a half six years worth of experience on app engine uh, and the supporting technologies i've never seen as much interest as i have in the last two, three months, as well as the local region opening up. I think it's also fair to say that Google has been putting a lot more effort into this region uh, themselves. You know, more people, the Cloud Summit uh, recently, you know, has made a big difference. And to put that in a, in a fairly sort of simple way, we traditionally would have a new developer start at three weeks and they hadn't had any real experience. Like they hadn't even deployed an app onto App Engine because it is, it's unusual. You know, they're used to using local tools uh, on their local machines. And when they first look at it, it's like, okay, well, I'm not sure what this thing is. But recently we've been getting people through the interview process who, who have had that experience. And I put that down to the fact that there's a Sydney region, there's excitement around it, and there's energy being put into it from, from Google. So we're really looking to be Looking forward to be part of the uh, the community here in Sydney and also in Melbourne. Cool. Well, uh, Graham, Andrew, again, thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Always good to have more Australians. Uh, I really appreciate <laughs> you both taking the time to uh, talk to us today about the Sydney region and what you both do with both the companies you work at. Thank you, guys. Thanks, thank guys. Thanks so much to both Andrew and Graham for taking the time today to talk a little bit about all of the things that have changed uh, since there's a new region in Sydney and also for sharing all of their requests, which are really good. And I'm sure there's PMs listening somewhere. I'm sure. Uh, yes, and thank you very much to Graham and Andrew. Um, but continuing on, uh, why don't we talk about our question of the week. Uh, this week, we are talking about TensorFlow. Now, I don't know a huge amount of ten about TensorFlow, uh, but we got a question in from one of our wonderful listeners. I'm going to mispronounce his name most likely. Uh, Simon Akashina, possibly? Akachina? I, I'm going to say it's Simon Akachina. Well, or you're, Akachina. You're probably... I'm not very sure, but I'll something just, like that. I'll just somehow Australianify it. It'll be fine. <laughs> But he asks an interesting question about whether TensorFlow is good for general math computation, like doing linear algebra or even just adding stuff together. Like, can you use it for that kind of stuff, Francesc? So the quick answer is yes. And it totally makes sense because if you think about it, machine learning is basically about like matrix multiplication, mostly. Mm -hmm. Some functions on top, but it's mostly matrix multiplication. And linear algebra is also very often a matrix multiplication or operations over matrix, right? Like dot product and multiplication and like uh, decomposition and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it totally makes sense that, you know, if something is good for machine learning, it should be pretty good 
for linear algebra. Now, the cool thing that I didn't expect is that if you compare TensorFlow versus NumPy, mm -hmm. TensorFlow is incredibly faster than NumPy. Interesting. And I am not sure if it is because TensorFlow uses the GPU, which it does, unless you're running it on a MacBook with the latest version of TensorFlow, which reasons. But mm -hmm. um, in general, you're going to get an incredibly faster computation just because you're using all the GPU. And I will add a link to a specific article where they compare NumPy to Theano to TensorFlow. Theano is a different library that provides similar things as TensorFlow, really. And you will see that both Theano and TensorFlow are almost exponentially faster than NumPy for most operations. It is pretty amazing for things like finding the minimum or the sum and stuff like that. TensorFlow is basically the whole line is basically flat on how, how long it takes uh, to find the sum of a matrix. No matter if it's 500 elements or 5,000 elements, it's still pretty much the same, which is really good. So if you're doing linear algebra, I'd say try TensorFlow. It is really simple. Most operations have the same name in both in NumPy and TensorFlow, so it's not very hard to move from one way to the other. And at the end, you're going to get code that executes way faster. So definitely worth trying. Awesome. Well, that sounds good. And thank you for providing that answer. I learned something new today. That you're very welcome. <laughs> That's good. All right, cool. Are you headed off anyway special, doing anything cool, just for funk? Uh, so, yes, by the time this episode comes out, I will have an, the second part of code review that I did on Just for Funk. It's a code review for a URL shortener, which is the second part of that. And other than that, I am going to fly to London very soon. I will be speaking at Velocity Conf in London, which is nice. on Wednesday 18th. And then uh, the day before, on Tuesday 17th, I'll be also speaking at the Go Meetup in London. Uh, so that's Tuesday, Wednesday. On Thursday, I will be speaking at the Cloud mm. Summit in Paris. And then on Friday, probably I'll just go and enjoy Paris because I think it's a beautiful city. Sounds like a reasonable and, thing to do. Yeah. And then I'll come back to San Francisco and then I'll go back to Paris for Doug Go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Planning. What about you? What about me? Um, so I will be heading off to Australia later this month, heading up there for the Melbourne International Games Week. I'll be speaking at Game Connect Asia Pacific, but hanging out at Unite and PAX Australia. Uh, and just before that, I will be also speaking at the GDG Melbourne Summit, which I believe is actually sold out, which is pretty awesome. Nice. So I think it is time to say goodbye. But before we say goodbye, there's a couple of things. I'm going to repeat this over and over from now on, which is please subscribe. And now that's more YouTube. But like, please let us know what you think about the podcast. Find us on iTunes or wherever you're finding this uh, podcast and leave comment, leave five stars and <laughs> leave a review. Uh, we'll definitely check those out. So uh, let us know what you think and send us more questions of the week. Yep. Specifically, we have an episode coming, uh, episode number 100, which is really, really important. Yep. We will be interviewing mm, Vinturf. V oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, very, very excited. Uh, so, Vinturf, for those that don't know, shame on you. Uh, but also, <laughs> if you don't know who Vinturf is, uh, he's one of the so-called fathers of the internet. Yeah. And basically, uh, we're going to be answer asking all of the questions that you want to ask him. Yep. So... In order to send those questions, please tweet to us at GCA Podcast with a hashtag, hashtag AskVint, uh, V-I-N-T. For those that don't know how to write their name, write Mark. Uh, <laughs> I, I know how to write his name now. It's fine. It's and fine. So, yeah, uh, send us your questions. We, we're really, really excited. Yeah. Uh, we have a bunch of questions already, but please keep on sending them. They're really good. I want to know where he gets all his amazing suits. Uh, store. He's always so well-dressed. He's incredibly well-dressed. He makes me feel like I should dress way better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I'm so excited about that episode. But anyway, send us your questions for Vint yep. uh, with hashtag AskVint or send us your questions for anything else because cool. um, we're preparing more episodes. Absolutely. Well, Francesc, thank you so much for joining me for yet another week. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for listening. And we'll see you all next week. See you all next week. See you all next week.